All right, thank you, Mr. Ken and Mr. Gallardi. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow your lead, Mr. Gallardi, and uh, this is the first curveball of the night, if, if you will. If, um, if any of you, who's the first um, person to tell me who was the, who was the race pitcher, the 2011 Rookie of the Year? And I saw the hand first. Could you, could you come up and uh, this is an autographed baseball by Jeremy Halek himself. So. Congratulations. That's uh, one of the few surprises that we have for you this evening. And um, hi, my name is Nicholas Lee. I'm the co-president of Management Society. And um, Tom and I were talking today that uh, it's pretty, pretty cool that this turnout that we have here today because the tradition from Coach Shane to Gene Shaw to various baseball players in the audience here today, that um, it's, pretty, it's a great tradition that we have here at Villanova and it can certainly build on it in the coming years. And if I, without further ado, I'd like to bring up the first panel. Um, while, they're, while they're doing that, um, to build off the keynote presentation, the, we're, we'll be discussing executing the, du the double play, profit and potential, with the focus being on how teams utilize profits to build a winning organization on and off the field. And, um, And start joining us on the panel tonight, on, on your far left, is Paul Martino, author of two uh, published books on baseball, um, the official book on baseball of general management and street smarts, the latter of which is in, enshrined in MLB Hall of Fame archives in Cooperstown, which I think is pretty, pretty cool. He has uh, spent 26 years as a leader work, working with global 500 companies, and we're, we're happy to have Mr. Martino here today. To his left is Mr. Bolton, Frank Bolton, a VSB alum. Um, <laughs> after a very uh, tw successful career on Wall Street, a good 25 years, he decided to take his expertise from the street onto the field when, when he founded the Ducks 12 years ago. And then to his left is John Rico. Last but not least, it's John Rico, um, the assistant GM of the New York Mets. And um, deemed the next John Daniels, Mr. Rico started, started his uh, career in the commissioner's office in New York. And uh, he was exposed to a lot of arbitration and contract cases. And that know-how served him well when he uh, was Omar Manaya's right-hand man. And now he serves on a team with uh, Sandy Alderson and Paul DePodessa, two prominent figures in Michael Lewis's Moneyball. And without further ado, uh, Mr. Bolton, uh, maybe you can uh, lead us off with um, in, in owning and building your own baseball team, how do the Long Island Ducks walk the fine line between profits and, and while still fielding a winning team on the diamond? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll handle it. I just want to make one little correction. Okay. I've been actually owning baseball teams for the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. I did have a 25-year Wall Street career as well, but I, they overlapped. I didn't, I'm not 75. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on my way to being 75. <laughs> And you can do the math, uh, because you're business people. Uh, but but I've, I've had the great fortune of owning affiliated teams and then starting an independent league. Uh, and, and in that little piece that CNBC did, kind of talked about why and how. And it's kind of long and complicated coming out of the 93, uh, out of the strike. And then uh, a, a baseball free agent camp down in Homestead is where I came with that idea. But I had two Yankee teams, so I got to work with George. And by the way, I agree with George as far as ownership in baseball. But, uh, but for me, uh, you know, what, what, what Mr. Kent and Mr. Glardy do, they're from the, from the outside the lines. They're the guys that bat fourth for me. Because whereas Major League Baseball is ha happy to have a team that may be worth half a billion making a couple of million dollars, I'm not. I'm not happy with that. I want a rate of return. So I need those guys that work and set up a budget. I and mean, we do everything with the Long Island Ducks, and that's how we stay profitable. Everything right down to the soap and the tray. And that's what these guys do. And they try to maximize and drive money to the bottom line. Because at the end of the day, because I'm a Wall Street guy, I like to make money. If I make money, I can help Villanova. I can help Coach Godfrey, <laughs> which I'm happy to do all the time. So, so, 
but we're competitive. And you get good baseball people, and you saw it in Moneyball, and you see it with guys. The first guy that I ever worked with, and before Billy Bean, the guy that I saw that was really headed down this direction and, and, and was looking at undervalued players was Brian Sabian with the Giants, the general manager of the Giants. And he was actually with the Yankees as an assistant GM when I had the two Yankee teams. So uh, yeah, I learned a lot from Brian and looking at undervalued players. And we started to look. There's a, there's a book, and it's now it's online, but we all get that book that has every player that's played the game, Major League, Minor League, in the, in the previous year, and it's got all the statistics. And you go through that, and you start to analyze it, and you bring in your baseball people. And for the Ducks, as you saw on the tape, we created an economic model where guys play in our league because the year before, as Buddy Harrelson said, they might have made a million dollars, but they're not this year. But if they go home, they're not going to make any money. So they got to get their innings pitched and they're at bats. So when John calls, they're ready to roll. And we sell out of our 200 players in our league, we sell 40 players back to double AA, A, triple A, and in, in times major leagues. Jerome Williams played in our league last year, but also played on the, on the Angels at the big league level. We've had two comeback player of the, the years. Ruben Sierra, although he doesn't send me the, his check, he made $10 million after he played in the Atlantic League. He was a comeback player. Jose Lima uh, was a comeback player, left our league, walked onto the field. Uh, Ricky Henderson played in our league, walked and played center field uh, the next night for the Dodgers. So we've had a lot of great stories. I've had a few bad ones. I had John Rocker. You might have read about that one. <laughs> Big mistake. In fact, uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, a person, uh, the gentleman who's the publisher of, of uh, Help Me Out Joe with Sports Illustrated, his daughter, uh, I think, might have graduated last year at Villanova. So he saw me, and he's going, Frank Bolton, Frank Bolton, Frank Bolton. You were the John Rocker guy we wrote about in Sports <laughs> Illustrated. And I said, guilty. So you know, you're not always going to be right. John knows that. And, uh, you know, and, and from our level, we get players, we help them. It's a great economic model. We have been sold out for 12 years in a row now. We have a 6,002 seat ballpark, and our average attendance is in 6137. So we're very, very lucky. But we know, we know part of it's your demographics, as was pointed out. We have in Nassau and Suffolk County. By the way, anybody been to a duck game? Thank you very much. <laughs> and and uh, we have three million people. So, you know, Long Island's ambition is to become a parking lot. So we have a density of population. And we know that if, as long as we do our good job and we make sure that experience from the time you get out of your car to the time you get back into your car is the best possible experience, we start with a great game, and that's baseball. And that's how we do it. Definitely. Great points, and I think Mr. Rico can certainly speak to that, how to you know, build, build your team from the draft, free agency, and maybe can take us through that process. Well, you know, I'm the one person on here that spends the money. You know, Rob and, and Mike <laughs> talked about how much we do spend, and, and certainly player salaries drive uh, our expenses. Um, but really, my side of the house, we're charged with putting together a winning product, and, uh, and that's what we set out to do. Um, from an economic standpoint, uh, a big part of what we do is, is go out and look for trades and free agent signings, and we try to maximize the amount of money we have to spend each year and put a representative team on the, on the field, hopefully, with a chance to win. Um, one of the things I've been fortunate or unfortunate in my time with the Mets, I've gotten to see you know, years where we headed in with very good teams and uh, years where we didn't have such a good team. But every year, you strive to put the best team on the product for the amount of money you have. At the beginning of the year, we're told the budget that we're going to have to spend. And uh, it's really like putting together a, a puzzle. There's a lot of different pieces that, that you have to work with and uh, try to formulate and put that all together into a winning product. Um, one of the things Nick and I were talking about were how we go about signing free agents. And I've been fortunate since we've been there to be in some in rather large negotiations. Uh, my first year with the Mets, we uh, we're uh, at the beginning of a, uh, forming our own regional sports network. So ownership charged us with turning a team around that in 04 had not been very good, but they knew in order to sell this new network, we had to be good pretty quickly, and they gave us the money to do that. We went out in the market and aggressively pursued Pedro Martinez and Carlos Beltran, um, and via trade, Carlos Delgado, um, and, uh, and we're aggressive on that, in that manner. Uh, bringing them in, turning the franchise around. We were pretty good in 05 and then went to the LCS in 06. Um, but you're, you're 
Your mission really changes year to year. Um, and I think you guys who live here down here in Philly have seen that. You know, the Phillies now are in a position where we were, were a few years ago where you have things going on good. Now you're trying to supplement and add, and it's a, it's a challenge to do that. Uh, a couple years after we signed Beltran and, and uh, Pedro, uh, we made a trade for Johan Santana. And, uh, and again, you know, we, we're working within a budget. Uh, we're working with ownership. Uh, ownership has a big role, as, though, as, as you might think, the GM has all the all the decision-making power. When you're dealing with 50, 100, 150 million dollar contracts, the owner is going to be the driving factor behind a lot of what you do. And in those types of deals, certainly the owner plays a big role. Um, one thing I thought of in terms of uh, the business side of it, uh, most of the time it's, it's the, the GM, assistant GM, and the owner talking about these deals. But uh, and, and the marketing side and the business side of the house doesn't get too involved in that part of it. But uh, a few years ago when we were discussing how strongly we were going to pursue uh, a Japanese player, Daisuke Matsusaka was coming over as a pitcher coming over from, from Japan. And we knew that that was going to open up a new market to whatever team signed them. There was going to be business opportunities over in Japan, uh, as well as in the U.S., uh, opening up new opportunities that might not have been uh, available before. So we had our business department run uh, different models to see how much additional revenue we thought would be generated by a Matsusaka signing. And we factored that into our equation when we were deciding how much to offer him and how aggressively to pursue him. Ultimately, the Red Sox uh, won the bid for his, uh, the ability to sign him, and he, and he went there. But uh, um, that's just a, kind of a flavor for how you know, we work with the business side. On, on a day-to-day -day basis, we, factor, we think about the business side in everything we do, because at the end of the day, we are trying to market a product to our fan base. In New York, we're in a unique position where we're competing not only with the Yankees, but with a lot of other uh, uh, avenues where people can spend their entertainment dollar. We have to compete with Broadway. We have to compete with all the other sports teams. And so we have to keep that in the back of our minds that we have to uh, put a team on the field that's not only a winning team, but interesting. And that creates a whole other challenge for us. Um, so. Essentially was offensive minded throughout its history. Um, I lived in Dallas for 19 years, and I had worked at American Airlines, uh, uh, American Airlines uh, reservations and revenue management, and I also uh, went to SMU. So I spent a lot of time down there, and uh, we actually were changing the world in the technology world down there in the 1980s, and uh, I actually had a strong interest and passion for baseball, which we'll talk about later of how we got into the sports. But uh, what I zeroed in from all the years living in Texas is that the casual fan always knew the Rangers would not win. In 1983, I was in the stands and fans were talking about the Rangers will never win a world championship because they don't believe in pitching. Um, in my book, I won't go through the many areas around pitching that I felt the Rangers were lacking. But leading up to when Nolan Ryan bought the team, um, I, I identified two specific arguments the Rangers had for why they didn't have pitching. The first was, it's too hot in Texas. Well, I lived there for 19 years, so, and I also was born, I was born in Manhattan, and I've lived in Philly, so I know how hot it is, and I also know that Atlanta's called Hot Atlanta for a reason, so it's hot in a lot of places. So I said, okay, let me give a comparison. I know when I grew up and I went to Shea Stadium, Yankee Stadium, and the Vet, there were a lot of day games being played where that sun's beating down on you. I also went to the Jersey Shore a lot, and there are a lot of people in bathing suits out on the beach frying because it's so hot up here. So I looked at the Texas Rangers and I said, all right, they've got 81 home games. Let's look from June to August, the summer months. Well, 40 games uh, or uh, all but two games were played at night, not under the sun. So that leaves two games. Okay, that means two pitchers all summer will have to pitch a home game for the Rangers. Now, if a game is four hours long in the American League, two hours the pitcher's in the dugout, not in the sun. So at least two hours. Now, a pitcher doesn't pitch nine innings, he pitches six innings. Okay, so that means like an hour and 15 minutes he's out there for the entire summer. So he didn't buy it. So he called that out to said, look, 
that's not a reason you got to go out and get pitching, and Nolan Ryan is focused on that. The other area was they didn't, they were, they considered themselves a quote, s a small market. Well, w again, we ran the numbers, and uh, the Texas Rangers are, let's see, the fourth largest metropolitan area. Compare Atlanta, who is known for all great pitching. Um, they were ranked 33rd. Uh, the Rangers uh, payroll was ranked 21st and the Rangers were blaming that were indicating that when they won in the 90s uh, their payroll was small when they spent a lot of money in the early 2000s with a rod and other folks they were losing so my argument uh, the Reader's Digest version of what I ultimately came up to at the end the end result was it's not about payroll, it's about pitching. And basically I sent the book to Tom Hicks and to Nolan Ryan and I indicated, whatever you do, put all your trust into Nolan Ryan, let him run the thing. Yeah, so. and, and the Rays have a, a lot of pitching as well. As Mr. Gilardi mentioned with Matt Moore signing on to that big deal. We can just go right down the line starting with you, uh, Mr. Gilardi. How were you, um, able to break into this very competitive field. I know there's a lot of you know, undergraduate students and maybe we'll just go down the line if tell you a little bit about your story, how you were able to break into the bigs. Uh, you know, actually I, I could probably attribute it to uh, divine intervention. It was, it was really, it was luck. I, I have to admit, um, I had you know, climbed my ladder, through, climbed the ladder at Ernst & Young, kind of got burned out there, um, you know, went, jumped over to Comcast, um, worked, you know, worked up the ladder there and um, you know, I, it's funny, you know, people talk about how hard it is working at, um, in public accounting. When I was working at Comcast, I was working more hours than I was in public accounting. So, you know, I was at the point where, okay, uh, you know, I got to have a life. I just got engaged, and I, and I, I told my, uh, my fiancé at the time, I said, you know, she was just, she was just finishing up medi medical, um, or, or medical res residency. And I said, just put your resume out, you know, you know down um, in, in Florida. My parents were living down in Tampa Bay at the time, and her parents were in uh, West Palm Beach. Within a week's time of her sending out a resume, she got a, you know um, uh, an interview, and two weeks after that, she got an offer. So I said, I guess I'll pack my bags, and you know I, I was confident in my uh, my credentials. I had you know the the uh, CPA, I had my my years with Ernst and Young, I had my um, my years with Comcast. So I was just super confident. I just didn't realize that the the whole uh, Wall Street was gonna was gonna implode. So. Um, you know, so this is this is basically 2007, uh, May of 2007. I'm getting married Ju June of July of 2007. I still had another job down in Tampa, but I was I was secure would be fine. My wife had her job lined up, um, and uh, you know the, the recruiter that I was working with um, got me a job with or got me an interview with MetLife. I did well with that, and then um, you know a couple days later, um, he's like, Hey, how would you like to interview with the Tampa Bay Rays? And I just knew the Rays as being you know the, the bottom dweller. And then um, I just did some research, just saw about talked to, read, read about the new ownership, and you know this at the time was like a 28 year old uh, president, you know Matt Silverman and this and his you know uh, young counterpart Andrew Friedman, and you know it just started intriguing me. Then I started talked to some of my parents' friends down there, and it ended up I, I took the interview. Two days later, I got the got the job, and I, you know the way I sold it there was really I told Matt Silverman that I could basically deliver you know billion dollar company financial you know operations to a uh, let's uh, say uh, a fraction of, of a billion dollar companies, you know. Um, so, you know, I brought in, you know, the financial reporting that you get from uh, Ernst & Young and also the, the tax background, you know, um, I was able to, you know, you know, size, you know, don't tell your accounting, pro accounting professors, but gap is the least thing anyone cares about, and, you know, on a baseball team, you know. Uh, so owners want to make sure they're getting their tax losses or minimizing their taxable income. They want to make sure they got their, their cash flow. So you know, they, but they also wanted the, you know the financial reporting. They wanted you know tax tax information. They wanted to um, just improve their overall operations from Com from Comcast. I brought um, a lot of business intelligence. You hear that buzzword nowadays. You know, um, we started setting up all dashboards. And you know, when uh, you know when I saw Stu, Stu Sternberg, who lives up in Westchester, New York, you know, emailed me from his home saying this is great. He was able to monitor our t ticket sales like on a given day. You know, we we have um, we uh, it's automatically refreshed. It's linked up with our Ticketmaster database, you know, so I started employing that stuff, and, and that's the stuff that I brought from, from Comcast. I mean, you know, you, you know, decisions had to be made, you know, snap of a finger, and, and there were some of the things that I was able to bring, but, 
you know, so I guess in a, in a big picture, I was able to bring a lot of skill sets and a lot of the interns that, I, that work for me, I just always keep reminding them, build your skill sets, whether it's tax, financial reporting, you know, operational. You know, the one thing that I also see that's very lacking, it, it sounds minor right now, it's maybe to you guys, but Excel skills. I mean, where I ex exceeded it um, in Comcast is I was able to build a lot of complex, you know, financial mod modeling. And, you know, these guys talk about projecting out years. I mean, you know, I'll meet with Matt Silverman and Andrew Friedman on Friday. We're going to project out five years what our revenues and our, you know, what basically we could cover, you know, in, in player compensation. Because they're, they're thinking that far out. They're not thinking, you know, this year really. So um, it's building those models is, is key. And, you know, I have a lot of interns working for me. They can't even, you know, link one page for, to another. So, you know, build your, you basically build your skill sets, is, I think, is a, is a big key. Right, Mr. Kent. <clears throat> I kind of touched on mine, but I'll focus on how I first got into the game. Um, I, I was the kid in high school who loved baseball but couldn't play it very well. And there's, a, there's a lot of us out there. And I was a big New York Mets fan. I grew up on Long Island in Garden City, came to Villanova, and Coach Shane knew that I, I had a passion for the game. I was good at scorekeeping and doing statistics. But there's not a lot of jobs in baseball for people like that. So I got my degree in accounting and worked at Deloitte, Haskin, and Sells. I knew I wasn't a traditional accountant. I, I knew that I wasn't going to have a career in the big eight at the time for very long. I wasn't manager material or partner material. I didn't like reading accounting literature. <clears throat> and I, um, I actually interviewed one time. I never, my son Jonathan is a student here. I never told Jonathan this story. So um, I actually interviewed for an internal audit job with Doubleday. And at the time, Doubleday was uh, the owner of the New York Mets. And, the interview didn't go real well, and I figured out, I'm not sure how long I'm going to stay in public accounting. And I thought, you know, they're having winter meetings. It's like an annual convention every December. All the minor league and major league teams gather. And uh, that year, it was Hollywood, Florida. It was 1981. And uh, I, I went down to the meetings and kind of took some time off from public accounting and passed my resume around. and. Uh, would meet people in the lobbies, and it, it was a great experience because I, I was the kid that would read the sporting news, and I would know all the pictures and the names, and I didn't need the, the proper introduction. I, I would walk up to somebody and introduce myself, and um, after two days, I had one job offer, Frank. It was from a minor <laughs> league team in Visalia, California. They wanted me to sell program advertising, and I, I couldn't sell anything in my life. So um, I was kind of discouraged, and never been to Florida before, the Miami area, so I decided that morning, instead of doing the same thing for like I'd done the last two days, I would go and like a canal cruise through Miami. So this is a true story. You never know where your path is going to lead you. I went to the hotel elevator, and the door opened up, and who was there but Bill Giles. Bill Giles was the executive vice president of the Phillies at the time. He was buying the team from the Ruley Carpenter family for $30 million. You saw the number. And they were getting league approval that day. The treasurer of the team was George Harrison. He was related to the Carpenter family. So when there's, when there's sales of ownerships of Major League Baseball teams, typically the first people to be cleaned out in the process is the finance department because they're the old group and they want the new owner wants his people coming in. Uh, so. I told Bill the same story I had told probably about 50 times that the last of the last two days. And he said, send me a resume in the mail because I didn't have one on me. So I mailed it to him. I remember talking to Coach Shane as to what should I do next. And he said, go for it. Keep, you know, call, make an appointment. You'll do your efforts to get me an interview. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, I did go down and I met with the Phillies that February of 82. I met with Jerry Clothier, David Montgomery, and Bill Giles, and Bill Webb, and Jerry Clothier offered me the job on the spot, and it changed my life. Um, he, Jerry's no longer with us, um, but he meant everything to me. He, he was my mentor. He encouraged me that if I wanted to con continue to pursue a career in baseball, and I wanted to be the chief guy, maybe an expansion team would be the next route. So. Jerry put me in contact with Bill Giles, and again, the process started all over again. And Bill took my resume to Colorado, showed it to the ownership group there. 
Uh, my only point is if, if you want to pursue something, you've got you to move. You've got to make it happen. And if you, if you really want to be in baseball, uh, start making your move now and start pursuing it. It may not happen in the next 12 months, uh, but there are openings in this game. We don't have a lot of turnover in our department. We haven't had a turnover in the last four or five years. But certainly with amongst 30 clubs, if you're willing to relocate, working at the minor league level or the big league level, there's jobs in baseball for you. And to build off Mr. Kent's point, I mean, uh, Mr. Rico, do you, have, do you look upon anybody that was your mentor, you know, whether it was, you know, Sandy Alderson or the guys, your big numbers guy, so is there anybody that led you that, that route? You know, <clears throat> I really, I guess I owe my baseball experience to Villanova on multiple levels. Um, when I was here as a student, I, I was a big believer, and I came here, and I saw the size of the school, and I said, that's going to give me the ability to not only excel academically, but participate in extracurricular activities. So uh, right off the bat, I became sports editor of the Villanovan. Uh, I applied for internships. I interned at WPVI-TV. And uh, as I worked my way through school, I knew I wanted to work in sports in some capacity. I did the traditional flood the market with resumes upon graduation. I've got binders full of rejection letters. Um, but you got to do it. You got to put yourself out there. I did that. Got a call from the New York Yankees uh, six months after I graduated for a, an interview for an internship. I went in and uh, met with their uh, director of media relations and didn't know it, but he was a huge college basketball fan. And the entire interview, I'm looking over his shoulder at Yankee Stadium, and all he wanted to talk about was Rolly Massimino and the Villanova basketball. <laughs> so I had no idea. We're talking, and I have no idea. At the end of it, he's like, okay, when you can start, can you start Monday? And, you know, that's, that's how it started for me. And, uh, Don't tell Rolly that. Yeah. yeah you know. um, but it, it, Villanova really helped me on multiple levels, as I said. It, it, it enabled me to have the ability to participate in extracurricular, also gave me the foundation. I was a communications major with a business minor, gave me the educational foundation that I would need. Um, but the biggest thing I would say is, you know, it, it allowed me to go out and do things beyond the classroom. And that's where not only you learn, but you form contacts. Getting into our game is very difficult these days. There's so many people out there trying to get in. And it's all about relationships and meeting people. And the only way that happens is to put yourself out there and volunteer or, or, or uh, apply for internships. Um, and, and it can happen. I mean, if, if, you, uh, if you put yourself out there, doors will open. And then the other piece of advice I always give is to focus on the job you currently have, not the one, the next one. There's, there's, you want to have a long-term plan, but so many people I work with are in a hurry to be the next Theo Epstein or the next young, young hotshot GM. And they're looking beyond their current job. You know, my, my uh, point of view has always been do the job that you have right now and everything else will take care of itself. Do the right thing. You're going to be taught, and you hear it over and over again, the Villanova way of treating people and respecting yourself and respecting and bringing that work ethic every day. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet, but I've, I've definitely lived by that, and it's taken me to some pretty good places. That's great. And Mr. Bolton, you have certainly, you know, achieved your goals and taking, taking your experience from the street on, onto the baseball field, and maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Sure. I mean, I, I don't think Wall Street had a lot to do with me owning baseball teams other than the fact that I was fortunate enough to be able to write the check you know, as an owner. That's what you have to do, ultimately. Um, but but where, where it did come into play, unlike Mike, I was the guy who actually played. I played for Ted Williams up in Massachusetts. Uh, I was recruited to play football and baseball here at Villanova. And I didn't come to Villanova. I went to another school, and I broke my neck. And then a priest that I had met during the recruiting process, a fellow named, uh, priest named Father John Melton, who had worked at Monsignor Bonner and then Malvern, right, Father Peter, you probably remember him. We all, Father John was a wonderful guy. He came and got me, and he said, you're going to Villanova. And I did, 
And the only side of that is I had it go every year. I had it, Father John would call me up and say, girls at Pendergrass need a date for the prom. You're going to have to go. <laughs> so that was my, what I had to pay back. But what I learned here at Villanova, and more than even Wall Street, was I learned how to learn. I had, had the jersey taken off before I wanted it taken off. So guys on the baseball team play every game like it's your last game, because it could be. Mine was, uh, you know, hurt playing baseball first and then severed a vertebrae playing football. And, and so, you know, so for me, when you have that jersey taken off before you want it, it's very incomplete. So I got to Villanova and I was like a mess. And I wanted to, what I learned here at Villanova was I learned how to learn. Because before that, I was athlete first. Here I became a student, which provided me the job on Wall Street, which provided me the opportunity to go back to my love. And as a matter of fact, my Villanova roommate called me up one day. I'm sitting on the 96th floor of the World Trade Center trading bonds. And he goes, there's a team here in Hagerstown, Maryland. It's, it's uh, for sale for $200,000 in the Carolina League. And I said, he said, they offered me 25%, but you know I hate baseball. And I said, OK, uh, $50,000. I'm on the 96th floor of the World Trade Center. I'm a hands-on guy. I'm going to pass on it. But then it started my interest. And I started to study minor league baseball. A lot was going on with the, with, with the professional baseball agreement and, and, the, and the, the player development contracts and facilities starting to come online. Uh, so, so facility standards became a big thing and new ballparks became in play. So being a smart Wall Street guy, I bought a team five years later for a million dollars in the same league. <laughs> it was positive that the needle would come off the record and I would have paid the highest price ever. Well. It wasn't that way, and as you can see with franchise appreciations, they continue to grow. Uh, so, so I've been very fortunate, but again, uh, all the way back to everything I learned here at Villanova, because it wouldn't happen without my Villanova roommate, it wouldn't, ha wouldn't happen without Father Melton, it wouldn't happen without what I learned here at Villanova. <laughs> Mr. Bolton touched on you know, the topic of success, and I, and I, I believe that Mr. Martino um, studied that in his books. and. Um, his success factor starts with ethics, and I think he can elaborate on that a little bit more. The, the, um, you know, I realize and I appreciate how fortunate I am to be up here in this panel with these great baseball minds um, coming, sitting up here as an author. Uh, what it got me down this road here to Villanova and have the opportunity to speak with everyone here was actually back in 1972. Uh, there was a Sports Illustrated Baseball it came out one year, it was the 1971 season, and there was no calculator. And I sat in a room all summer and I played all 162 games for all 24 teams, and I kept the stats for every single ball player throughout the entire thing. Willie Stargell hit 75 homers that year. So, um, <laughs> the, um, and then uh, I read Megatrends in the late 70s and I knew Technology was the direction I was going to go in, and I wanted to change the world the rest of my life. And I've been perpetually fortunate to be one, two, three generations ahead of whatever you're seeing. But baseball has always been my passion. So when I was uh, working down, at, uh, down in Dallas uh, in 1985, baseball positions don't open up that often. Uh, it took me three years putting in for game day statistician position for, uh, at the time, sports ticker who got bought out by ESPN. And you have somebody representing that team, so that would be the Rangers. Um, when they grilled me on my stats, since I did, I did all those stats, I could do them in my sleep. So they were thinking it would take me a little time to do some calculations, and I was just reeling them off. So I got into the game and for 16 years, first with the Rangers and then covering Yankees and Met games. I was covering 80 to 100 games a year. Um, now, when I decided I was going to go for my doctorate, that's when I wrote the books. And it was very fortunate that the Colorado Rockies purchased my book, and they had made a reference. And I truly appreciate how lucky I am to be up here today. So in return, I've, for my career, I keep a toolbox of success factors and I'm, I hope you enjoy these. I hope you, you could take these away. I believe these will help your career no matter which career path you take, whether it's baseball or any other field. Um, and I'll leave a soft copy for you. But, so here goes some success factors for you. 
The first is, it all starts with ethics. Uh, don't believe Hollywood. The bad guys do lose, whether it's prefer, uh, professional, personal, spiritual, at the end of the day, they lose. Uh, and I don't know anyone who wants to work with somebody who's not ethical. So that's number one. It starts there. Um, come to play with a ticker. It's all about passion. Uh, I think everyone in baseball, the ones who excel are the ones who actually have a profession. And in the world of technology, um, the same thing. Uh, in, on Wall Street, I think anywhere, you've got to have a passion for it. Live with tick. Don't wake up every day and do something that you don't really like doing. Pick something you have a passion for and live with a ticker. Um, every success er, is gained or lost in the preparation. I guarantee you, in, in my mind, what happens in the next two weeks before the Giants and Patriots kick off that football, that game's already been won by one of those two teams. We'll figure out who prepared the best. Um, stone Age did not end for lack of stones. Um, <laughs> and that's really key because no matter how good you are, don't be complacent because whether it's a merger, a takeover, uh, a leadership team comes in and wants to put their own people into place, uh, or something happens and you need to move, you never know when your career is going to change. Um, I started at the dawn of the PC era, and there are a lot of technology firms that were great in the 1980s, brilliant people, and they wound up having to find new careers. So. Um, there's a, lot, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, education is, is long, knowledge is power. Willie Mays said after 22 years, he still went to the ballpark and learned something new every day. Um, look at the, how the world has changed in the last 20 years. It's going to do the same the next 20. I know you're excited about getting your degrees at Villanova, but I would say continue. You're going to be continuing your education throughout your career and stay close to Villanova and always look at what opportunities they provide for one-off classes and, and other certifications. Um, always have an elevator pitch. I was walking down the hallway with the CEO one day and everybody went down the hall. He said, how's it, uh, how's it going? And everybody said, good. How you doing? Good. 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 So we walked into his office and he said, I am really worried. He said, nothing's that good. Everybody's good. So have an elevator pitch. You're one, one, you, every time you meet with uh, someone, it's your next opportunity for a first impression. And just think of a few bullet points like you're getting on an elevator. Um, you've got two floors to tell your boss or whoever or a potential client three key items, no matter what it is. Um, being right is not the most important thing. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people insisting to prove that they're correct and they wind up not getting promoted or losing their job or quitting because they're so angry because they were right and they didn't get their way. Uh, be confident but leave the ego at the door. I'm going to give a quick uh, example here. Um, well, I would go into the Yankee clubhouse and there's Yogi Berra, Phil Rizzuto, the most natural down to earth people in the world and I thought as a young person, I said, if these guys are down to earth, who the hell am I to ever think that I'm any better than anybody else? So that, they led by example. Uh, the, um, also, I would say uh, the most powerful man in the world, the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, um, when he was assassinated, he, they had him replaced in two hours. So realize that your position is important but you could always be replaced, so leave your ego at the door. Um, animals eat vegetarians too. So don't think because you did it, you got straight A's at Villanova, you got this great degree, um, that you're gonna be given anything. You're gonna have to continue to earn whatever you, whatever success you have in your career, you've gotta earn it. Nothing's given to you because you were good or you're a nice person. Um, protocols matter. Um, know your place. Networking is, con is significant. There are a, a tremendous number of folks here today. Know your classmates. Keep, keep track of them. Stay in contact with each other. You never know when you're going to help each other out and do something great during your career. Um, down the home stretch here. Success versus failure is perceived through accurate expectations. If you're telling your boss everything's great, 
and then suddenly at the last minute something falls apart, they go, what the hell happened? It's a failure. But if you tell your boss, look, we have these three risks, and I'm monitoring them, and you give them reasonable uh, updates, high-level updates over the course of time, if, in fact, one of those risks becomes a showstopper, well, and then you go and correct it, well, you've prepared them so that whatever you're doing could still be a success. So set proper expectations. And Mr. Martino, I apologize on that note. Um, you know, all, all of these panel members have been quite successful in their field, and that's why it's uh, quite interesting to hear what they have to say. And um, if you could help me thank them for uh, being here today, that would be pretty <laughs>